Hi, Boca L Eagles. This is Miss Bennett from the Media Center. So today's lesson uh, we is titled "America is Under Attack." That's the book we're going to read, and it is by Don Brown, and it is going to give the portrayal of the events that happened on 9/11. And then when we finish reading, we're going to understand why we still remember all the victims that perished on that day. So let's get reading. America is under attack. A bright morning sun lit a cloudless blue sky. America started its day. Highways filled with traffic. Railroads rumbled with trains. Airports roared with jetliners. Among the hundreds of planes rising into that flawless blue sky were two from Boston, one from Newark, New Jersey, and one from Washington, D.C. Among their ordinary passengers were 19 deadly men. They were followers of Osama bin Laden, leader of an organization known as Al-Qaeda. The group hated America's power and influence. Bin Laden promised violence against America. The 19 men had pledged their lives to fulfill that threat. At 8 o'clock a.m. on September 11, 2001, they acted. With knives, pepper spray, and threats of bombs, they stormed the four airliner cockpits and wrestled control away from the pilots. The jets were no longer just ordinary airplanes. They were weapons. The planes banked away from their flight paths and headed for their targets. On one of the planes, a flight attendant managed to alert someone on, on alert the on-ground authorities to the hijacking. She reported, something is wrong. We're flying very, very low. Before them loomed the World Trade Center on the lower tip of New York's Manhattan Island. Each skyscraping tower was just over 1,350 feet tall and boasted 110 floors. More than 14,000 early bird workers had already arrived, a fraction of the 50,000 who worked there. At 8.46 a.m., the plane slammed into the North Tower. Flying at 450 miles per hour, the jet exploded through floors 93 through 99. The earth shook, debris and flames hurled from the opposite side of the building. Fire Chief Joseph Pfeiffer was out with a truck and his crew in Lower Manhattan when he heard the plane approach. He looked up and watched and the jet smashed into the tower. Everyone get in their rigs because we're going down there, he said. Inside the tower, an inferno of jet fuel shot down a thousand feet of elevator shaft to the lobby and lower levels. I heard a roar, said police captain Anthony Whitaker, who had been standing at his regular early morning watch at the base of the tower. I saw a gigantic fireball. I turned and ran. The building suffered horrible damage. People on lower floors could escape down the stairs, but hundreds of others on higher floors were trapped by burning wreckage and a ruined stairwell. Many used their cell phones to call for help. 3,000 calls were made to, nine, to the 911 emergency system in 10 minutes after the crash. Overloaded circuits made connections difficult. Trapped people were told to wait for help. Chief Pfeiffer and his team marched to the North Tower and set the alarm for more firefighters. They and other rescue workers quickly arrived, sirens blaring. Emergency vehicles flooded lower Manhattan. Within 17 minutes of the crash, a thousand fire police and rescue workers swarmed to the World Trade Center. Many were off duty. They simply reported to the scene when they heard the news. Among the rescue workers arriving at the North Tower was Chief Pfeiffer's brother, Kevin, a lieutenant in the fire department. The two men shared a few moments together and turned to their duties. Chief remained in the lobby to direct the arriving firefighters. His brother headed for the crash site. Two companies of firefighters were ordered up to the flaming wreckage, 90 stories above. They entered the stairwells and began a thousand foot vertical climb. Each firefighter carried more than 80 pounds of equipment. Without elevators, it would take more than an hour to reach the impact site. We started up from the ground floor. 
We would take it 10 floors at a time and catch our breath, said a fire captain. This way, we would have some energy to do whatever we were going to do when we got to the upper floors. The fire department's plan wasn't to fight the fire. Firefighting systems in the building were probably damaged and probably irreparable. So we determined early on that this was going to be strictly a rescue mission. We were going to get people out. And then we were going to get out, said the fire chief. The fire department ordered everyone out of the building. A total tower evacuation had never been attempted before. It had never been practiced nor ever planned. No one had imagined what a catastrophe, imagine a catastrophe that would require it. Meanwhile, Captain Whitaker, the police captain who earlier dodged the fireball in the tower lobby, ordered a full evacuation of the World Trade Center, the collection of buildings that was home to the Twin Towers. Poor communications and a damaged public address system made it nearly impossible to broadcast the evacuation order. People in the building continued to receive mixed messages from the emergency operators. Some said to stay put, others said to leave immediately. Some people left, others departed and returned. In the North Tower, the fire department even had trouble contacting their firefighters as they climbed the stairs to the impact zone. Their handheld radios barely operated, making receiving orders, making and receiving orders was hit or miss. High on the 88th floor, Frank DiMartini, the building's construction manager, hadn't heard anything from the rescue operation based in the lobby. He didn't even know about the plane crash. He thought someone had planted a bomb or that a mechanical room had exploded. His office was wrecked. The ceiling had collapsed. Flames licked the walls and smoke filled the air. Dazed people stumbled out. He surveyed the ruins, gathered a team, and went to work. First, Demartini discovered an open stairway and sent down more than 25 people who had been trapped. Among them was, was his 89-year-old co-worker, Mo Lipson. My heart was pumping harder than usual, Mo said. Then Demartini, along with the co-worker, Pablo Ortiz, and others made their way up to the 89th floor. They found more people trapped by debris, freed them, sending, them, sending the rescued people down the stairwell. Demartini and Ortiz continued up towards the unknowable chaos, looking for more trapped survivors. The floors at the crash site were a tangled burning wreckage. Smoke billowed across lower Manhattan. On the floors above the burning rubble, hundreds of people were trapped, using phones and emails and voice, voices sometimes calm and other times frantic. They sent the same message, we're stuck, send help. Police helicopters flew close. People were hanging out of the building, gasping for air, said a helicopter crew member. There was no way of getting near to anyone in a window. We were helpless, totally helpless. Heavy smoke and intense heat from the fire made rescuing people from the roof impossible. Some of the trapped people jumped. Suddenly, a helicopter shouted, There's a second plane! Stanley... Primna saw the second jet race straight at his 81st floor office in the South Tower. He dived under his desk, screaming. Everything exploded. Walls and ceilings collapsed. Part of the jet's wing jammed into a door. The overpowering stink of jet fuel made breathing difficult. But Primnath was alive, the only survivor at the heart of the impact. The second hijacked jetliner had crashed through the 77th to the 85th floors of the South Tower. Massive flames spewed from the towers. Wreckage rained down on the streets. It was 9.03 a.m., 17 minutes after the strike on the North Tower. Now people understood the earlier crash was not a freak accident, but a deliberate attack. Despite the horrific crash, one stairwell in the South Tower remained intact. Unlike the North Tower, people above the crash had the means to escape to the street. In the chaos, however, many people would not find it. Firefighters scrambling into the South Tower discovered a working elevator that carried people to the 40th floor. From there, they climbed a, they climbed a stairwell. 
passing them on the way down were escaping civilians. The lack of panic by the civilians impressed the firefighters. People patted the firefighters' backs, wishing them well. In return, the firefighters encouraged them for their long flight down. Below, one elevator screeched to a halt at the building's main lobby. It had plunged 900 feet before the automatic safety brake stopped it. The riders pried open the doors and escaped. In the North Tower, another elevator sat stalled and locked, closed at the lobby. It had come to a halt when the plane struck. Chris Young, its lone occupant, knew nothing of the catastrophe around him. Firefighters going up could hear his shouts and marched past him, unaware of his predicament. High above was another trapped elevator. From its intercom, the riders learned there had been an explosion. The riders forced open the doors and discovered they had stopped in front of a wall. One of the passengers was a window washer. He began scratching the wall with the metal edge of his squeegee to make a hole. Dense smoke billowed off both towers, falling wreckage hurled to the ground. Despite the risk, hundreds of firefighters, police, emergency and medical technicians, private security guards, and even workers from the neighboring hotel stationed themselves around the World Trade Center, tending to the injured and helping office workers flee. To avoid the debris raining down on the plaza outside the towers, they were direct. They directed evacuees through neighboring buildings or through underground corridors. Thousands streamed away. At 9.37 a.m., 200 miles away from the disaster zone in New York, the military's headquarters in Washington, D.C., known as the Pentagon, became the third target of the hijackers' attack. The jets swooped low and plowed into the building at ground level. The flaming impact nearly reached the center courtyard. It was a loud roar. The building shook. Jet fuel poured into the corridors and ignited, taking all the oxygen out of the air, said an army officer. The heat inside was so hot, it felt like the sun kissing you, said a soldier. Rescuers raced to the scene from exits everywhere. 20,000 people eventually evacuated the building. Back in New York, in the wreckage of the South Tower, Stanley Primnath yelled, help, help, I'm burned, I'm buried, excuse me, is there anybody there? Brian Clark was there. He had been fleeing his ruined office when he heard shouts. Clark and Primnath clawed the rubble. Clark yanked the trapped man free, and the two fell to the floor in a hug. I'm Brian, Clark said. I'm Stanley Primnath, said. The two men found a stairwell and headed down. Thousands of people escaped down the ta- escaped down the tower stairwells. The injured, the old, the handicapped were helped by friends, by strangers. People shared drinks. A blind man came down with his guide dog. Two brothers trudged the stairwells. One, a firefighter going up, the other, a businessman coming down. They didn't meet. Not on the stairs. Not on the stairs were co workers Ed Baina and Abe Zel- Zelmanowicz. Baya was paralyzed in a wheelchair. There wasn't an elevator for him to escape. Zelmanowicz waited with his friends for rescue. They were eventually joined by Fire Captain William Burke. Together, the three waited for the available rescue workers to carry Baya down. By 10 o'clock a.m., lines of firefighters stretched all the way to the 54th floor of the North Tower. At the same time, in the South Tower, one hard-charging fire chief made it all the way to the impact zone on the 78th floor. Chief Oreo Palmer used the elevator to travel 40 stories and then raced up 38 flights of stairs on foot. Hundreds of miles away, another kind of desperate action unfolded. The fourth hijacked plane was still in the air, creasing the Pennsylvania sky. By way of cell phone calls to the ground, passengers learned of the attacks in New York and Washington. The passengers decided they had to fight back. They stormed the cockpit. The hijacker hijacker pilot pitched and banked the plane to throw the passengers off balance. 
at 10.03 a.m., the jet rolled in, on its back and roared earthward. The passengers were still battling when the plane smashed into the field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, in New York, molten aluminum poured from the South Tower as the remains of the jetliner melted. Watching the disaster was a city building engineer, one of the many government officials who had rushed to the scene. Surveying the damage, he warned the fire, de fire department commanders that the tower was close to collapsing. The warning came too late. At 9.59 a.m., the South Tower came down. In 10 seconds, the Mammoth Building was reduced to rubble. It looked exactly like an avalanche coming down the street, at you, a policeman said. A cleaved, it cleaved a neighborhood hotel in two. Cars flew through the air. Giant steel girders tumbled like toothpicks. We saw air conditioning ducts. We saw parts of buildings and newspapers and debris all in a dust ball coming at us, said a police captain. The collapse generated a furious wind. One police officer was thrown from one side of the street to the other. I was literally blown out of my shoes, she said. A monstrous dirty cloud covered everything. Picture taking, flower, and sticking it up your nose and your mouth. That's what breathing was like. Another officer said another, said another officer. At the same time, I'm feeling debris hitting my legs, hitting my ankles, hearing it pile up above me. Fire Chief Pfeiffer and the other firefighters in the North Tower lobby heard a rumble. I thought something was crashing through the lobby. We hurled down at the base of the escalator, the whole area becoming totally black, Pfeiffer said. We stayed there until the rumbling stopped. I never even suspected the second tower collapsed. In the North Tower lobby, the doors of the stalled elevators opened. The collapse of the South Tower had cut the power to the elevator's door lock. From the car emerged Chris Young, the trapped passenger who had been overlooked by the rescue workers. Earlier, he had boarded the elevator from a polished modern lobby. Now he shuffled through the clouds of dust over rubble and debris alone. Pfeiffer and the other firefighters had fled the lobby when the wreckage of the South Tower billowed through. Up to that moment, a few, few people believed the building could be brought down. They had been designed to survive a jetliner collision. The towers had survived a massive terrorist bombing in 1993. And by the city's fire regulations, the floors were supposed to withstand two hours of fire. Now, the chief's orders came quick. Tower one, to all units, evacuate the building, evacuate the building. A police helicopter hovered near the top of the wounded North Tower. It looks like it's glowing red, the pilot said. Moments later, he added, it appears to be buckling. Not all the firefighters in the lower tower had heard the evacuation orders. Some didn't believe it. Others wanted to evacuate as a unit and waited for the fire company fellows to gather. Many of the emergency workers climbing the stairs were unaware that the South Tower had collapsed and failed to grasp the urgency of the evacuation order. Some wanted to catch their breaths before continuing. We'll come down in a minute, said one. When Fire Captain Jay Jonas leaned, learned the South Tower had crashed, he said, it's time to get out of here. He led a small group of rescuers down the North Tower stairwell. Around the 12th floor, they met a groaning and crying Josephine Harris. Bad feet and a 60-story descent had brought the office worker to a stop. Bring her with us, Jonas said. They urged her along, but the pace was very, very slow. At the fourth floor, Josephine quit. We're just going to have to drag her, Jonas thought. Then he felt the shaking and the floor rolled like a wave. The tower pancaked down with tremendous booms. One floor hit another 10 stories a second. The banging, the screeching, the roaring, the collapsing floor drove a furious wind ahead of it. One of Jonas's group was tossed a floor below. Another was thrown three floors down. 
The others hugged the floors. A quarter mile, that's 1,350 feet of glass, metal, plastic, marble, rubber, telephones, copiers, office desks, filing cabinets, ceramic tiles, drywall, copper pipes, steel sheets and steel beams and steel rods fell all around them. It crushed a neighboring trade center office building and demolished the nearby hotel already cleaved in two by the collapsing South Tower. And it was only 10.28 a.m. In 102 minutes, hijackers had destroyed the World Trade Center, crippled the Pentagon, and doomed four jetliners. 2,973 people were dead, and more than, a, more than the number of American killed at Pearl Harbor on D-Day. It was the largest loss of life on American soil as a result of a hostile attack. Among the lost were faithful friends, Ed Bea and Abe Zamanowitz, along with the firemen who didn't desert them, William Burke. Chief Palmer, the first uniform rescuer to reach the North Tower's 78th floor impact site, perished. Frank Demartini and Pablo Ortiz died too, but not before rescuing scores of others, mostly strangers. Stanley Primrath and Brian Clark survived. Trapped elevator passenger Chris Young escaped too. A surprise fireman discovered him in the North Tower and whisked him to safety. 89-year-old Mo Lipson climbed down 88 floors, walked a mile, and then hailed a cab to take him home. The window washer and the people in the elevator with him tunneled through the drywall and the ceramic tiles into a bathroom. They all escaped. The window washer even brought out his bucket and squeegee. Incredibly, 16 people survived inside the North Tower, including Captain Jonas's crew. Josephine Harris pace had been a charm. Josephine Harris's pace had been a charm, but the building came down all around them. But the exact spot where the huddled in the stairwell remains where they huddled in the stairwell remains standing. If the group had moved faster or slower, they'd have died in the wreckage. She and the rescuers would later exchange Christmas cards. Chief Joseph Pfeiffer survived, but not his fireman brother. The last, the two last spoke in the North Tower lobby moments before Lieutenant Kevin Pfeiffer led his men up. Kevin Pfeiffer wasn't recovered from the wreckage until February. Joseph Pfeiffer was there. Not only did I see him go into the towers, but I also brought him out, said the chief. And that is the end of our story. So you can see why we still remember and memorialize September 11th. These brave police officers and firefighters that rescued people from these buildings. It's amazing bravery. Well, thank you for listening, and we will have more from the Media Center.